Hello and welcome. Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about a book I read over the last couple of days. It is The World, A Brief Introduction by Richard Haas. Richard Haas is, of course, the, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he recently released this book. Um, and the, the title is a really good kind of encapsulation of what the book is it's a really really brief introduction to the world in 2020 um, in the sense that it covers very briefly sort of relevant bits of history um, and then looks at how that how that history has again in a very brief way how history has shaped the world that we're living in today and the challenges that the world faces today. Um, it's a bit of an odd book in that it is so very brief. Um, in, and I say that because like, I don't really know who the book is for. Um, it seems like it hits for someone. And the reason I say that is because someone who picks up a book on a, on a topic is going to be sort of less likely to... Uh, they're going to pick up the book on the topic because they already have an interest in the what that book is about and assumedly have done some reading on the topic. And so a lot of what's going to be in here, these large sections of it, is going to be already known by the reader. It feels like a series of blog posts which are being compiled. Um, that being said, for someone who doesn't have any idea, this is perfect. I just don't know in terms of the medium it's being presented in, um, if a book is the best format in terms, in just in terms of selling it, I don't know who is going to necessarily buy this. It does come off a little bit like it would be a good text to use in a class of, of the same um, a university course maybe or um, even maybe later on in high school like the world a brief introduction like because it provides sort of a succinct overview of a topic um, and I'll just bring up the contents page here because um, it the book is split into four parts the first part looks at essential history um, and that is broken up into four sections. It says from the Thirty Years' War to the outbreak of World War I, so 1618 to 1914. Of course, it takes sort of the general approach of saying that the modern era really starts at the Peace of Westphalia, where we sort of get our, according to some people, we get our um, idea of the modern nation state and the way that the map gets built. Um, at the Peace of Westphalia, and then there is a, a period in which it eventually breaks down in the First World War, um, and then you have the interwar years, so 1914 to 1945, where he deals with, obviously, the, um, the First World War and the Second World War are part of that section, and then you look at things like the Great Depression, you look at the breakup of the various empires um, and the revolutions that happened. So the creation of the Soviet Union and the rise of Hitler. But like these topics that I sort of talk about are dealt with within a page or two. It's like that brief. The Cold War comes next. Then it obviously goes up to 1989. Um, and again, these are, this is in very broad strokes. Um, and then the post-Cold War era, he writes about 1989 to the present. So you get things like the creation of the EU, um, the breakup of the Soviet Union, some of the issues that has caused, um, and then some of the general trends uh, in, in recent years. Um, and then part two looks at kind of similar themes, um, but... It breaks it up by region of the world. Um, and so it can dig a little bit deeper into what each region, um, what the history is and what the current forces are 
that kind of affects it and it breaks it up within those sections and looking at like economics it looks at geopolitics it looks at um various factors um and so it looks at europe east asia and the pacific south asia the middle east africa and the americas um, and then part three is called the global era and it looks at sort of forces that are affecting the way we live our lives and the things that affect someone living in today's world so things like globalization terrorism nuclear proliferation, climate change, migration, the internet, cyberspace, and cybersecurity, global health, trade and investment, currency and monetary policy and development. Part four looks at order and disorder. And this is where it gets into some more sort of institutional things, um, the balance of power between states, um, and then sort of makes a bit of an assessment of where we are currently. And so it looks at sovereignty, self-determination, and the balance of power, alliances and coalitions, international so society, the war between countries, internal instability and war within countries. Um, sorry, the, the section before is war between countries. I think I said war within. Um, and then the liberal world order. So it goes through all of that. But then at the end, it provides a whole range of research. It provides an essay looking, um, talking about where you can get more information in terms of like the, the different sources you can get, like TV, looking at um, government resources that might be put out, um, how to assess news. Um, it even talks about podcasts, things like this. Um, and then it also talk, gives an assessment of like formal um classroom studies basically um and so it, there's an essay on that and then he provides a very long um kind of um, set of notes um and resources um so on all the different sections um and a very very extensive bibliography so um that is useful if you do want to go and read more on different things um like there's basically, um, unfortunately, I, I have a, a digital edition, but there's, I would, I would imagine a quarter of the book is the notes and those sorts of things. Um, in fact, I think in a digital edition, the first 50% was the actual book and the second 50% was th the back matter. So like this essay and the the resources and stuff like that. So, like I said, it's it's very quick. It's very um, if you know the, the stuff, it's it's all going to be review of stuff you've learned before. If you don't know anything about um, history, about international relations, foreign policy, um, politics in a global sense, you're going to learn. Like really the the language I would say and the, the basic pieces it's like the um if I was to put this in in terms of like mathematics it would be like learning how to add subtract divide those sorts of things but for these areas so it's like it's a very surface level thing but it gives you like a really nice overview um, when I say it's very basic. That's not saying that it's a bad book. Um, not at all saying it's a bad book. Um, it's just because that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to be very basic. It just is a little bit odd that it's, it's published as a book and not as some other kind of resource. I feel like its in impact could be much better as another type of resource, especially given that the Council on Foreign Relations has such a... Um, powerful website like their website is very very good and they've they do all of those sort of overviews and really cool scrolling web page i feel like that would work pretty well with this content so it's a bit odd that it's been written as a book the one criticism that i would have is that it is very pro-us um and 
not in the sense that it's pointing to um, specific policies or anything like that. It's more just the language it uses when it describes, say, Europe is very different than the than the language it uses when it describes the US. Um, it ascribes the and and this sort of really pops out to me when in the the chapter where it talks about Europe, I might actually just pull it up here and see if I can um, just read it to you. So, um, in the introduction to the chapter on Europe, here's what it says. Contemporary Europe stands out from much of the world because its relative wealth, is, because of its relative wealth, its large number of democracies, and its considerable peace and stability. Europe's economy is slightly larger than that of the United States and represents one quarter of the global economy. Nearly all of the region's 50 countries are judged to be free or partly free. The region is largely at peace with the important exceptions of Ukraine and Georgia, both of which are contending with aggression supported or carried out by Russia. Other parts of Europe, such as Cyprus and parts of the Balkans, still suffer from communal tensions and territorial disputes. Um, and it goes on and talks a little bit about um, NATO. I'll just bring up a part on the United States. Um, and it's just very different. Um, so here's the part of the United States. It says, the United States, with a GDP just over $20 trillion, accounting for one-fourth of global output, has the world's largest economy and is the dominant country in the Americas. It represents nearly a third of the region's population and approximately three quarters of its economic output and possesses power and influence on a different scale from the other countries in the region. The United States enjoys many advantages such as a rich variety of natural resources combined with soil and weather conducive to agriculture, a degree of protection provided by two oceans and friendly neighbors to its north and south. Other U.S. advantages are man-made, including its political stability, its rule of law, its ability to adapt its great universities, and a tradition of being open to immigrants, which has provided great talent and allowed the country to avoid demographic imbalances that would be difficult to sustain. So, like, there's a difference in the language there. It's clear, I mean, obviously... Richard Haas is American, clearly he's, and he's worked in the White House um, under various administrations. So you can forgive him for being pro-American, um, but it, it does come off a little bit weird where he talks about other parts of the world, which are, I mean, he this, this section here talks about, he spends about 60% of the introduction to talking about the Americas, um, talking about the, the US, um, and then very little talking about any of the other countries, of which, like, South America is a very significant part of the world, and there's just sort of no acknowledgement of that. But that's just, like, that's really the only gripe I had with the book, um, is that it was very pro-American. It did have some very interesting discussion specifically around um, demographics um, in the, the chapter on migration was really interesting looking at how demographic flows in and out of countries um, can seriously affect different things and this is something that I've come across in in other fields as well looking at economics looking for example at Australia became very successful economically and a large factor in that was that a large number of working age people migrated to Australia in the period of like 1850 to the beginning of the First World War. And so you had a very large working age population um, versus other countries which have either very young populations or very old populations, but the working age population is very small. That part was particularly interesting. But yeah, overall, if you do want a really quick read as like an overview to kind of patch any holes you might have, then this is definitely one to pick up. It won't take you long at all. 
um, to get through. But if you, this isn't one to pick up if you if you're sort of quite well versed in the subject. Um, it may be a nice one just to have, um, and it would make a good gift, I think, for someone who maybe is going to study these things or just is interested. Um, it's a good gift because it is it, it's just a very like sort of brief, easy overview of of the topics. So thank you for watching. Um, next up, I am starting Walter Isaacson's The Wise Men, the six friends, uh, six friends and the world they made, which is about Dean Atchison, Avril Harriman, um, Bob Lovett, John McCloy, and some others which are escaping my head, George Kennan, and one other that I'm not thinking of right now. So and sort of looking at how they built the world order after World War II. Um, and it's Walter Isaacson, so I'm expecting it to be very good. So that's next, um, if you do want to read it. Um, and I will hopefully have that book, that review out fairly soon. It is a little bit of a longer book, but um, I do plan to get through it fairly quickly. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in... or. Uh, I might not see, oh, I won't see you, but this is available on YouTube if you do want to watch it. Um, it's also available as a podcast, um, and there's a, there's a podcast feed. It will be in the description um, of the of the video.